Public clouds abstract away much of the nitty-gritty work that goes into provisioning infrastructure, including networking. Application teams can quickly connect resources and deploy applications without having to know much about the plumbing that links everything together. And when they compare the public cloud experience to standing up an application in an on-prem data center, the on-prem experience sometimes isn't so great. There's tickets and configurations and ports and policies and hours or maybe even days of waiting. Uh, Today on Heavy Networking, sponsored by Juniper, we're going to talk about how Juniper's Appstra software can help you operate your on-prem data center more like a public cloud, meaning service provisioning that's repeatable, standardized, straightforward to consume. We'll also talk about how Appstra now works with Terraform to help streamline network service. Our guest is Chris Margett. He is Senior Product Manager at Juniper Networks. And in case you're thinking Chris is just some cloud-native guru who is descending from the mis-shrouded summits to scold the network groundlings, fear not. He's a longtime network engineer with the scars to prove it, and he can speak directly to the complexities of the data center. Uh, So, Chris, welcome to the podcast. Uh, Before we get into the cloudification of the data center, can you give us a little background on Appster because it does have a unique approach to data center operations and automation? Yeah, I've I've been in this industry for about uh, almost three decades, but Importantly for this conversation, you know, only the last couple of years I've been at a vendor. So I've been customer side ops and I feel like I understand what uh, what operators need mm-hmm. pretty well. As far as Aptra background, I, I want to start with EVPN because that's mostly what we're going to be talking about today. Aptra can do a lot, but an EVPN, BGP, VXLAN, modern data center overlay is where we're going to be focused. Mm-hmm. EVPN is probably appropriate for anybody who needs to do any VLAN anywhere at anything approaching scale, right? If you don't have the light up the same broadcast domain on a bunch of ports scattered around, or really even on, you know, more than probably about two switches, you know, you might not need EVPN VXLAN. For the folks that do need EVPN VXLAN, one of the things Appster can do is make that pretty easy to consume. Yeah, if you've encountered any of Appster's messaging before, you've heard intent-based. Right. And... I didn't understand what that meant for a long time. But what what it really means for the purposes of this conversation is that we can focus on outcomes, network services, mm-hmm. and not have to think about the config minutia that makes it happen. Right? Ultimately, you need to light up a VLAN or an IP link or a BGP relationship or whatever it is to something outside the fabric. And Appstra makes it so that you can just say, I need a subnet and not... I need all these leaf switches to peer with each other and these route reflectors and, you know, map these VNIs to VLANs and all of that stuff goes away. Point here is that sometimes configuring an EVPN results in 100, 200, 300 lines of CLI if you're doing it that way. And it's very difficult to get that right. And what you really want is just a connection between this server and this server. You want a VLAN between them or an IP, you know, subnet extension, whatever, right? And you just don't want to be, you know, arcanely using a text munging in an Excel spreadsheet and then trying to read it, it just gets less precise at this sort of scale when we get to this level of complexity. There's a lot to do on a lot of boxes with a lot of details you can get wrong. You know, I I know the packet pushers audience are clever people. They could Mm -hmm. individually get it right and learn how to do this. But once there's a team of operators, the the likelihood of getting things wrong just goes up and up. No, you don't get Uh, to go home at five o'clock. Uh, yeah, configuring two two hundred lines of CLI, <laughs> right? It's just too much to go wrong. You know, do you know what I mean? Like, and if you've got to configure that on you know thirty or forty switches in a clove fabric, it's just not not it. Yeah. And that's where we. That's the whole intent based idea is that you move away from this. You're doing fairly repeatable things. Like configuring VLANs isn't exactly uh, magic in twenty twenty three. No, cer- certainly not. Mm-hmm. Um, So, yeah, that's what Aptra means when they say intent-based, you know, in in this narrow – Aptra does a lot, but in this narrow uh, uh, discussion, uh, you know, it's it's writing configs uh, based on service outcomes. Uh, that you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And and Aptra does it, right? There's there's no magic. Aptra is banging out CLI configs for whatever platform you're working on. And, you know, it it logs into the switch probably the same way you would. It just does it really consistently and – you know, doesn't make mistakes. And it can also validate configs to make sure that that service outcome is actually being delivered, right? It validates both that the config is in place and hasn't drifted for some reason. Mm-hmm. And because Appstra understands, you know, what it means to have an EVPN and what it means for the, you know, a certain service to be exposed on various switches, Appstra can validate the actual state of the control plane and make sure that all the right routes have been learned in the places where they're supposed to be. Make sure that the cables are actually in the ports they're supposed to be in, that kind of thing. Um, and what about things like analytics, reports? Do I get a sense of what's actually happening inside uh, the data center? 
indeed, there's a whole raft of analytics and reporting and intent-based analytics capabilities. And more, in fact, there's new announcements, you know, by the week. Okay. And I think another thing to mention is that well, Appster is a Juniper product. It is, in fact, multi-vendor. I don't have to run all Juniper switches. It doesn't have to be an all Junos environment. I can mix and match. You can run Appster against Junos boxes or Cisco's boxes or Arista's or uh, Dell boxes run in Sonic or what have you. If I do like to do configurations or there's a special case, I want to make sure uh, you know a senior engineer is actually looking at, can I get into my switches and do some manual work? This, yeah, well, you're not locked out of the switches, and there's nothing weird about the configurations on them. You can log in and poke around. If you do something that Appster's not expecting, it'll probably complain about that. The right way to put weird extra little bits of config in is to provision those as configlets. But the vast majority of the data plane config is generated by Appstra. But yeah, the, the CLI is still available. You can log into it. It's it's still your Junos or your NX OS or, or whatever under the hood. Okay. And what about things like rollback, roll forward? Can I do those kind of actions in this Appstra system? Appstra has a point in time rollback feature. So you can, you know, in the case of a disaster, you can go back to before you broke it. Uh, <laughs> or, you know, it, there, there's checkpoints. That's how you go home and have dinner. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's not working, lads. Click, click the rollback. We're off home. We'll work on it tomorrow. There's a lot that's worth money to me, that is, right? Yeah. So, so how is this deployed in the data center? Are we talking about agents on switches? Is it an appliance or a VM running somewhere? How does it how does it get into my my data center? We deliver Appstra as a uh, virtual appliance. You can run it wherever it is convenient for you to run it. Appstra interacts with the switches through their physical management port, so an out of band Ethernet. Okay. And the specifics of agents and whatnot sort of depends on the platform. On, on some platforms, uh, Appstra reaches in, you know, using NetConf over SSH. On other platforms, we install an agent on the switch, and then that's a REST over TLS uh, connection between Appstra and the switch. So it, it all depends on the platform. Okay, but Appstra is not like in the data plane. Appstra is not in the data plane. If you run Appstra and decide you don't like it, you just power that VM off and take over as though you had written those configs yourself. Okay, so we're not talking about sort of the old-fashioned SDN controller with all those calls up to the controller and then back to the switch and so on. Yeah, you have no reliance on Appstra operating in order to forward packets. Got it. It can continue to run in its last good configuration or last operational configuration. It, it, it's really just type and switch configs and loading them into the okay. running config on the devices. That would be very appealing to a certain type of person, I think. For sure. Okay, so the whole premise of today's conversation then is about trying to operate your data center more like a public cloud. So why is on-prem networking harder than, say, deploying a VPC or a VNet? What's different about cloud versus uh, on-prem? We've already talked about the fact that on-prem, you know, the way you're probably doing it is with configs box by box. Uh, there are other automation schemes. You know, you could be automating that box by box config with some other tooling. You could have vendor proprietary tooling. And sort of no matter what you have, there's a high probability that your automation system is not super well integrated with the rest of the things you're doing in the data center. Mm -hmm. You think about what you do in AWS, right? You ask your AWS VPC for, you know, a, a new VRF or a new subnet or, you know, a, a VPN connection off to something, right? You're probably also going to run an EC2 instance and put it on in one of those subnets, or, you know, configure routing between your VPC and some external thing, or, you know, start some workload that requires a new subnet and requires DNS addresses and requires a load balancer to be configured and all that. That stuff is super well integrated in public cloud. On-prem, whatever tooling you're using for your on-prem thing probably isn't super well integrated with your load balancer or your IPAM or whatever, right? These, uh -huh. are, these are separate yeah. tasks. Where if you look at the, the life of an SRE doing work in public cloud, they're taking responsibility for all those different things, and they're running them all at once in an app deploy. That's the scope of project in public cloud is deploy the app, not deploy the network for the app and then think about all the other stuff separate. Uh, we can change that. You know, when we say run it like the public cloud, we mean, you know, easy to consume and well integrated with all of the services required to deliver some business outcome. Okay, so you're talking about not just you know, setting up a VLAN, you're also talking about orchestrating with other systems, IPAM, load balancers, firewalls, et cetera. The business doesn't want a VLAN. The business wants an app running. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. It's not routing IP packets. It's not running cables through yeah. data centers. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, you know, the point of, of all of this is never the network, right? We're trying to deliver business value. Mm. Okay. 
Um, so <laughs> one of the things we're going to talk about is um, using Terraform with Appstra. Um, <laughs> network engineers are talking a lot about automation, talking about Python, talking about things like Ansible, Terraform may be new to them. What's the value prop here? Why would I want to do that? Usually when network people are talking about automation, they're talking about a vendor solution for automation mm -hmm. or they're talking about Ansible, right? And Ansible is a really good way to, you know, render text, right, into routers and switches. And that's about the best we had. But, you know, that implicitly that means we're talking about box by box, you know, rendering templates for for workloads uh, or for you know for outcomes abstra changes that uh, abstra gives us this outcome based you know service based uh, interface and it's a lot like aws and and both abstra and aws have a gui right but if you look at how people consume aws you know nobody's running their cloud stuff at scale uh, with a gui so you know, you, you need an orchestrator to run those things at, at anything approaching, you know, complicated or to make it, you know, safe or repeatable. And so that's what we offer with Terraform. Now, because network operators have never had the opportunity to use Terraform, they're probably not familiar with it. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you, it's not scary. Um, it is, you know, co compared to some of the alternatives, it is super streamlined and easy to consume. And at its core, what Terraform does is it gives you a text-based UI for anything with an API. So, you know, what you would have done in the GUI before, now you just type a few lines of text and it ha accomplishes the same outcome. Okay, but isn't this then sort of bringing me back to I'm doing my handcrafted configurations again? No, because the, the text that you're creating is text that says new subnet. It's not text that says, you know, this VLAN on that switch and that VLAN on that switch, you know, using this VNI over the top and these BGP relationships, right? We're, we're way abstracted away from the device configs. Mm -hmm. So it's the same high level abstractions that you get from Appstra or from a public cloud provider in text form rather than in point and click form. I've always thought of Terraform as the answer to the question of networking is just one of the things I need to instantiate a service. I've also got to do storage and VMs and allocate compute cycles. But if I'm in a public cloud, I've also got to do with I'm going to do all of that in a different language because the cloud, the public clouds are proprietary, right? AWS has its proprietary APIs and Google has its proprietary APIs. And so you need to speak a different language and you need a way to bring them together. Because if you are, you know, trying to do something in the data center and you want to talk to a storage array and say, allocate some storage, or you want to configure an eVPN, you want to talk to a DHCP server, you know, you might have an IPAM appliance over there that's doing DNS registrations and IP address management and all that sort of stuff. If you're just a networker and the only thing you're looking at is the network, you can run Appster as a standalone through the GUI. But if you're trying to stitch all these things together in an automation, you really need a language that sits above that. And that's not Ansible. People sort of rejected Ansible years ago. That's where Terraform comes from. Yeah, I agree. And it's, you know, the public cloud analogy, you know, the different public clouds are different, right? If you want to set up a load balancer in one cloud versus another versus another, we all know what the tasks are, right? Define a front end listener, define some back end pools, define some, you know, route based, you know, URL based traffic steering. But the way you accomplish that in, in any of those environments is always going to be different. Mm. Uh, Appstra is, you know, a super strong analog for what you get from the VPC in AWS or, or mm. the, you know, the networking constructs in any public cloud. And it's just one more of them. And your cloudy SRE folks are super accustomed to understanding the high level abstractions and then learning each implementation for for each service and and we're right. just one of them. Now so it's sort of like in the you know 20 like 10 15 years ago everybody knew a particular CLI or they knew a particular you know set of command structures or you could you know write vv script in Microsoft and get but what's happened is we're now in a situation where those things don't run standalone. I need a language that configures or operate. This is an operate Terraform is an operational language really, isn't it? It's not a, a program as such. Yeah, you can do some, you know, instantiate variables and run loops and stuff, but no, it's not a full pro programming language. It's really yeah. just uh, your, your Terraform config is effectively a list of nouns. There, there are no mm -hmm. tasks. It's just things that should exist listed as, as objects. Yeah. I'm just trying to lay the picture here of why Terraform. Terraform is really the universal tool that spans on-prem, off-prem, spans verticals inside of the data center. If you want to instantiate a container, you could use Terraform. If you want to run a Kubernetes uh, pod and you know manage the whole pod, again, Terraform. And so Terraform is becoming or has already become the default language 
or the default tool for that. And that's why Terraform on Astra is the thing. Importantly, it's not just that it knows how to talk to all those things. It can mm-hmm. stitch them all together. Right. So if your Kubernetes and your load balancer and your DNS service all need to agree about the host name for some service, right? One of them chooses and the rest of them learn it or, you know, however those things work. Terraform, you know, can pass data from one service to another completely seamlessly. Huh. Um, now, you know, we, we started with GUIs, right? And, and people are comfortable in GUIs. The reason you would want to replace your GUI with text, right? There, there's a bunch of reasons, right? One is it's super hard to document uh, what you're going to do or what you, what you expect your network to look like, right? It, you're, you're left with screenshots. Mm. Same with change plans, right? It, you know, what are you going to bring to the change review board? Or how would you tell a peer what you need them to do, what you need them to change? Click on this, then click on this, then check that One box. One of my favorite type, things you know. in the world was bringing the CLI for a change control and giving it to the change board, you know, <laughs> and the change board consisted of clowns from various other disciplines who wouldn't even know what an IP packet is. If yeah. you jumped up and bit them, on the, bit them on the nose sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? Like, but at like least you, there's no ambiguity that you did what you said you were going to do. That, yeah, exactly right. As if right. I could have that. So, yeah, you, you can't bring that to the change meeting. And, you know, at post-change, right, did, did the guy on third shift do what he was supposed to do? There's not a good way to check it all. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the GUI-based tools don't do any of those things. But, you know, if you convert what's going to happen in the GUI into some simple lines of text, then, you know, the sky's the limit for what you can do. Ter- Terraform also uh, revalidates everything in the project. So any line of text de- describing anything, it checks to make sure that it's still in the state it was expected to be. Mm. While Appstra won't let config on the devices drift, right? If someone clicks and changes something in Appstra for a quick experiment, well, that's the new expression of intent, yeah. right? Terraform mm. will check that and and you know realize that oh well the, the you know the the text you know from months ago says that a value is supposed to be whatever. Now Appstra has this different thing, you know, let's fix that. So you're saying that in an Appstra environment where things are generally run through the GUI, Terraform becomes a kind of documentation that I can use for sanity checking, peer review, what happened yesterday that resulted in this change kind of a thing. I like to think of it as executable documentation, right? Because it's, <laughs> it, it is the, the desired state of the network. It's uh-huh. human readable and you can run it as a project and you'll know if that's what's actually going out on the API. Okay, so that sort of helps me understand why Appstra would sort of embrace Terraform in the first place, because my impression of Appstra was the whole idea was to get away from config and speak, interact with Appstra more at a sort of business logic or intent layer or an outcome-based layer. So it feels like Terraform is sort of stepping backwards, but you're saying, no, there's there's actually a value proposition here. Yeah, I, I can walk you through an example. I mean, you know, imagine uh, you want to create a new subnet. Right. Let's not even talk about Appstra, right? Anything. Uh, if there's a create new subnet wizard in a web UI, you know, what's going to be in there? It's going to be a, a place where you type in the subnet. There's going to be a place where you specify the, the gateway on that subnet if you don't want it to be dot one. There's going to be a place to enumerate the DHCP relay uh, targets, right? Those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. If we had this GUI and it existed and you wanted me to do that, you know, what would you send me in an email to tell me to do that? Right. You know, Chris, please create subnet, you know. Cider block is this, the gateway is that, here's the DHCP servers, you know, whatever it is, right? And then I'll open up the wizard on third shift and do those things. The Terraform config, which is the documentation that does the same thing, it is literally the contents of the email you would send me. It's as simple as that. Oh, okay. And the real power here is that I, I think that a lot of people don't understand is that Terraform is using Appstra for the things that it does well, right? Terraform is not trying to configure the network devices. That's what Appstra is for. And that is the most effective way to use Terraform, in my understanding, is somewhere out there, there's a software that does a thing. It's a Kubernetes controller. It's an API in a public cloud. It's a it's an app, it's an a storage controller. It's a AppStrip, which is the network controller. And Terraform configures those. And because it does that, it means it doesn't need to speak networking per se. That's taken care of by the, the module that, that AppStrip represents to Terraform. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of bad Terraform providers out there that you know give you a different experience than you would have as the GUI user. But a good Terraform provider, you know, is an exact parallel with the web UI and you know is well aligned with the product documentation. And so you're gonna see 
you know, the exact things you would have punched into that uh, helpful wizard in the GUI. Right. And a uh, Terraform provider is the Abstra interface to Terraform the script or Terraform the language. Uh, in Terraform, Terraform's plugin based. So Terraform mm -hmm. does not know how to talk to AWS or Abstra or, you know, any of those services that you might want to mm -hmm. use it against. Uh, Terraform is a diff engine at its core. You know, it just it just finds differences in, in before and after states. Right. And exactly what those states are and what we're going to do about it, that depends on a plugin. And the, those plugins are called providers. And so the, you know, there's a provider for, there's thousands of providers for all kinds of things, uh, including Abstra. Okay, so then and are, are we talking about potentially using Terraform? Uh, instead of me going into the Abstra GUI, I would run my Terraform executable to get something done in Abstra? Yes, you would write down your intent instead of punching into the GUI into a text file. And then the command you would run is Terraform apply. And Terraform, you know, reads whatever's in your document, checks what currently exists on Abstra, calculates the differences between what your text says and what the API has, and it'll tell you we're going to create this, we're going to delete that, we're going to, you know, change the value of whatever, uh -huh. and you yeah. can you can then indicate that yeah, that's that's what I wanted. So you're sort of using Abstra as a configuration engine, but at the same time, Abstra does more than just configuration. It's also a telemetry, an asset management configuration. It'll update the software reliably and so on. We're talking today about how hard it is to do eVPN and write those configs, but yeah, but yeah, there's there's a whole bunch of analytics and device asset management and yeah, you know. Fault and see, the thing is that when you start talking about oh, I'm going to use Terraform to configure the network, you go, well, why why would I use app, a tool like Abstra, right? And the answer is because that tool does much more than yeah. even though Terraform, you know, you can use Terraform to configure the network to express intent so that Abstra can then do the underlying configuration so that you can, and that makes the Terraform writing the Terraform much simpler, right? Because you don't have to think of everything that apps just going to do for you. If you were talking to the device, you'd have to work out where all the devices are, blah, 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 right? So it really simplifies the, the networking. It, make it, it makes it like cloud-like is, is, I think, is just to abuse a word. It makes the network a cloud. Yeah. I mean, really, I think we're using Terraform to replace the GUI, yeah. right? And, and, and you know, the, the big reason for that is, right, you can, you can diff a text file. Right, you can't diff screenshots. Uh, you can take that text file and and run compliance validation tests against it. Right. Okay. Every new subnet has to have a you know a firewall attached. Right. Does that does this plan have a firewall attached? Right. You can you know the script that does that can exist. In some ways, it feels like you're grounding Abstra in a format that might be more comfortable for network engineers who are comfortable with text, as opposed to the magic box did something for me. Network engineers are really good at manipulating text. And and mm. this will be familiar for those reasons, yeah. Okay. Right. Still, Abstra does more than just configuration. There's telemetry, yes. analytics. You can get asset management reports. You can get, if you need to update the firmware on a switch, it will do that for you. It does all of the val config validation. So if your Terraform tries to load an invalid piece of configuration or generates an invalid configuration, Abstra will throw back an error up through the Terraform stack. Ultimately, Terraform is just clicking buttons in Abstra. It's just really yeah. fast, and and ultimately, Abstra is the one <laughs> that's generating all the device config. So I, I, I'm not comfortable mm -hmm. saying that we're configuring the network with Terraform. I would say that we are driving Abstra with Terraform. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's fair. Yeah. Because that's also what you do on an off-prem cloud, right? You talk to their configuration engine, which then goes off and does something underneath. So it's it's very cloud-like as well. Yeah, and you know, in public cloud, right? How does an IP packet get from one VM to another? Like, we, we don't care. So it's none of our business. We can't tell. It's not our problem, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, and and exactly. you know, that that's the same thing that, that that happens in an Abstra environment. Is you know, exactly how did that broadcast domain get created so we can push Ethernet frames from one side to the other? You know, does it matter? Probably not. Mm, yeah, no, probably not. We're gonna do it right, so you, you know, you don't have to concern yourself with that detail. So if we do adopt. Abstract Terraform, can you give me a perspective on how am I better off now than I was yesterday? I think I used the phrase XQL documentation before. Mm -hmm. Why is that helpful, right? So with executable documentation right now, we can keep a record of our Abstra config as text. We can make a Git repo, right? And that Git repo can have its own point in time checks. And we have, you know, we know who did the commit, right? These kind of things, the, the commit into Git. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have you know, roll back and roll forward and and checkpoint kind of stuff independent of Abstra. We now can open the door to all manner of, you know, cool kid modern workflows with GitOps and, and chat ops and whatnot, right? So 
the peer review process is now formalized through pull requests, for example. And if you put a CI pipeline in, you know, once the pull request is approved and the and you know the new configuration is merged with the main branch of the of the configuration repository, you know, GitHub or GitLab, whatever you're using, can actually push the change to after for you or on schedule or you know whatever whatever it is that, that you you know can dream up there. Mm -hmm. Your configurations can also be subjected to validation and compliance testing and you know running in other environments. Uh, if you needed to, you know, clone your data center for a test, right? What was in the old data center? Well, it's whatever's in this repo is what's in the old data center. Just take that repo and point it at the new environment. Um, so the, a lot of, you know, new possibilities uh, emerge. Also, you know, we talked about the ecosystem. You know, now that you're doing stuff in Terraform, your network changes and the changes you're doing on your hypervisors and your DNS and your IPAM and everything, that can become one project. Uh -huh. So, you know, we, we can think in terms of application deploy instead of, you know, configuration, deploy. you know, a deployment right. of a VLAN, which, right. you know, that alone is, does not solve any problems. Uh, and since now, if we're talking about app deploy projects, right, a project centric configuration is really powerful and not just uh, in the sense that, you know, we can sort of bundle everything together into, into one thing. But, you know, think about network configs over time. If you log into a switch, you know, and log into that switch years later, you know, one thing has happened, and that is the configuration has grown. And every time some little project comes along and maybe that project doesn't make it and it's killed off and whatever, there's going to be lines of config in there that nobody remembers why they're there. Mm -hmm. And No, never. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> so if your projects are you know, an app project and it has its own Git repo and that, that project needs to scale or it needs to scale back or, you know, the project is killed off or you need to clone something. So a developer has a private copy of, a, of an application deployment or, or whatever, you can roll forward and roll back individual projects. So, you know, a point in time rollback on the network is not very useful. It's great you know, in the minutes after you break the network. Oh my gosh, what happened? Roll back to what it was an hour ago. But, you know, when when a project is is eliminated, let's say, and a bunch of servers are decommissioned, you're not going to roll the network back to the state it was in two years ago. <laughs> right? That, that point in time rollback is not useful to you. But the point in time rollback of the project that owns those servers, that is super useful. Just wipe out everything that was associated with those servers. So all, all the VLANs and the VRFs and whatnot, that, you know, are in the same project as those servers, just take them out. That's interesting. And, and then, you know, the other thing you can do now is network engineers might not be super close to this, but there are people in your org already using Terraform for cloud stuff, right? And you can empower those people to control their own destiny uh, to, to the extent you're comfortable doing so, right? Self-service self and, you know, these kind of things are, are way more possible, uh, you know, with Terraform than, you know, turning the SREs loose on the Juno's command line, which you probably don't want to do. Okay, so this, I guess Terraform is sort of like a mediator between my SREs and the network engineers who can say, show me your Terraform and let me see, if, you know, let me at least get my arms around what's going to happen to my network. The constructs we expose through Abstra will be very comfortable to the SRE folks. And, and the reason I say that is, you know, they, they already have the experience of, I need a subnet in GCP and in, you know, AWS and, you know, yep. any other Azure cloud, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, one more version of, oh, yeah, I need to do the thing where I, you know, make a subnet and then I need to do the thing where I configure a load balancer. And, right, because we're talking only in high-level abstractions, they can handle that. And, and they already are. Mm -hmm. So then is this about the network engineers using Terraform or about uh, making the network consumable by SREs or DevOps folks using Terraform already? Both, um, you know, uh, full stack's a buzzword. Uh, <laughs> I think we make full stack more possible than it might have been otherwise. Uh, well, I think I think Terraform fits the description of full stack in the sense that it works on most pieces of infrastructure. So on-prem, off-prem, all of the different elements, most vendors have sort of accepted that a Terraform provider is part of their product strategy, you have to have it if you want your product to be consumed uh, by a particularly large set of the market. 
Yeah, for, for the SRE folks, I think that they'll they'll take to what we're offering just fine. Right, yeah. it, it will be it will be very familiar. For you know, pure network folks that are not familiar with Terraform, I, I want to reiterate, it's not scary. You know, if yeah. if you're not already familiar with these constructs, right, you know, you should yeah. probably be thinking about public cloud and public cloud practices. You know, for reasons related to your resume, this is a good way to get in. Yeah. I would encourage everyone to adopt this kind of yes. pattern. Even and, if and they're not dealing also, with us. Like, yeah, this is, well, I also want to encourage tooling. people to think of, it's to, it's to stop thinking of Ansible and start thinking about Terraform because I think long-term Ansible is sort of, is almost like a competitor to Abstra. You can use Ansible on Abstra for sure. And I'm pretty sure that uh, Abstra maintains, you know, Ansible modules and so forth and supports Ansible. But the longer-term direction that the industry has more or less decided on is that Terraform is going to be the tool that most people are conglomerating on for SREs, for DevOps, for infrastructure operations, because it's more useful or seems to be better. I don't know, maybe for whatever reason, who knows? There's very little rationale for what makes the standard these days, but that's what it is. Doing item potent operations with Ansible is tough. You know, if you want to say, make a new subnet, right? In, in Aptra and Aptra with Terraform, you don't need to be prescriptive about what IP block it's going to get and what VLAN number it's going to be. And what you can be prescriptive if you want to be, but there's no need to, right? You know, the, the tooling will just break off the next available one uh, automatically. So this subnet must exist is the, is the way to think in Terraform and Abstra uh, universe. In Ansible, it is create a new subnet, which if you run that five times, you get five subnets. If yeah. you run Terraform version of that five times, the first time it creates the subnet, and the other four times it checks to make sure it's still there and still working. Right. right. Uh -huh. uh, so, you know, in, in the Ansible approach, you know, validation of, you know, expected state is nearly impossible unless you're going to be prescriptive about every detail so that it can be rechecked and, and recognized. And that's because Ansible doesn't keep a record of what it's done, where Terraform does. Yeah. And, and you know, keeping that state is, is what makes a lot of this possible. I want to... Just highlight something I think you said that maybe got a little lost uh, in, as in regard to uh, an incentive to start looking at Terraform. You might be using this as a network engineer in the public cloud, too. You don't just have to be an Appster customer to start uh, getting your hands into Terraform. Anybody who's doing that already is is nodding their head right now. Right? So, so they know, <laughs> right? So so I'm speaking to the people that are not using it. You should check it out. And, and that's not, you know, uh, me trying to sell a product. That's me trying to tell you what's a good tool. <laughs> Okay. So one of Appster's value propositions is its vendor neutrality, I meaning it can be used with more than just uh, Juniper switches. We were talking about EVPN and VXLAN at the top. Um, vendors often implement them differently. Can I still use Appster and Terraform in a multi-vendor environment? Or is a, when I'm talking about building out an EVPN VXLAN network and using Terraform on top of that, is that limited to a specific set of switches or NASAs? Terraform has no opinion, right? Terraform is just banging against Aptra's API. So whatever Aptra can do, Terraform can do almost. We're a little behind on the features. We're catching up uh, on the Terraform side. As far as what Aptra can do, right, we support a bunch of different vendors' equipment. Uh, and, the, you know, Aptra can do a lot of different things. The thing we've been talking about, though, is the data center reference design, yep. right, which means we're definitely drawing a box around these capabilities. And, and that box is... Uh, a clo fabric, so mm -hmm. spines and leaves where every leaf is connected to every spine. Uh, it's EVPN with VXLAN signaled by BGP. And it can be three stages or five stages, so it can scale to sizes that uh, are kind of mind-boggling. <laughs> so, you know, we're drawing a box around it, but it's a good box, right? You know, the, the problem of delivering any VLAN to any port can be solved, and you can do just about anything you would want to do in a modern data center within the constraints of the, the box that is the Aptra reference design. Uh -huh. uh, if you want to get out of that box, Aptra can run other kinds of fabrics. It can do just an L3 only, you know, IP fabric if you have no need for VLANs. Um, and we've got a feature called Freeform where you can design any crazy topology that you want. Um, but, uh, you know, the majority of the things that, that give you the, the most power in terms of high level abstractions and getting away from, you know, vendor specific config minutia is the data center reference design and, and that's what we're talking about yeah okay that makes sense because i think yeah I, I do recall that after is sort of opinionated on the kind of data center you build yeah at least in terms of design not 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 gear not specific equipment 
Folks who are paying attention to Terraform know that HashiCorp, uh, which oversees Terraform, just put Terraform under a BSL license, um, which prompted some community members to create a fork. I think it's called Open Tofu. Uh, so that's always an issue. Uh, are you? What's your? Where are you coming down on Terraform, Open Tofu, all that? Uh, so the the fireworks have been exciting, and I've been getting a lot of questions about that. Um, so what HashiCorp did was they changed the license on Terraform Core, which is the you know Terraform super easy to consume. I, I don't know if I mentioned you know compared to other stuff we talked about, the tool chain for Terraform is one binary. You just download this one you know user bin Terraform and you run that, mm. and that's everything, right? There's not you know miles of Python, you know, requirements and dependencies and, and these kind of things. So that one binary is is now licensed under uh, BSL 1.1, which says, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not your lawyer, uh, which says you can use this in non-prod and you can use it in production, uh, provided you are not, you know, embedding it in your product or mm -hmm. otherwise competing with HashiCorp, yep. something like that, yep. right? So almost anybody can still use Terraform for free. Use the official, you know, uh, HashiCorp version of Terraform. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can't use it because you are a HashiCorp competitor or because you're, you know, afraid to ask your legal department for guidance or for some other reason, uh, you can use OpenTofu, which is the recent fork. Um, as it stands now, every uh, Terraform provider that's been released by anybody, including us, uh, will work with both. And we don't anticipate any changes in that regard. If something changes, we will absolutely be supporting OpenTofu in addition to Terraform if uh, if we have to take steps to do so. Okay. And my understanding was that HashiCorp took that step because they didn't want, uh, let's say, a particular cloud giant to take Terraform and essentially create it into a profitable service, that they, a for-profit service they would use to compete against HashiCorp, essentially. Cloud giants haven't done that yet, but, <laughs> you know, it's a smaller... Uh, service providers that run Terraform as a part of their product have done that. Right. And, and yeah, I guess that was what they took exception to. Yeah, because we, we've seen big companies take open source projects and commercialize them. Uh, so, yeah, that's I think that was HashiCorp's thinking. We want to protect ourselves. Yeah. The, you know, a lot of the complaints about the way the license change happened revolve around the fact that, you know, what does it mean to be a HashiCorp competitor? You know, what if what if HashiCorp, you know, gets into a new line of business that is close to what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. You know, that'd be a nasty surprise. Um, you know, what what does it mean to embed Terraform in my product? If, if I include the binary, is it embedded? If I if I, you know, ship my thing with a Terraform downloader, is it embedded? Right. Uh, none right, of this right. is clear. Uh -huh. So, you know, people are reading that ambiguous language and, you know, not understanding how to comply with it and, and freaking out a bit. Okay. Okay. My view is it's a kerfuffle in a teacup. HashiCorp hasn't taken anything away except from companies that might have been able to exploit Terraform for money. Yeah. In you know, this Terraform's still free. Anybody can access it. They're continuing to contribute to it, work on it. And for most enterprises, the uh, you know, uh, the only difference is that the BSL license that they apply to it isn't open source, and they might have to go to legal to double check that it's actually suitable or whatever. But that's and that's more of a, an annoyance than anything else. Uh, but I think the the main takeaway is uh, for, on Juniper's end, you're supporting Terraform and also Open Tofu for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I, I, we don't even have to do anything special to do it at this point. But you know, if we do, we will absolutely do whatever steps are required. Okay. Uh, and then <laughs> it's always tough to ask people to learn some yet another new thing to do their job. Does Does Juniper have resources to help folks learn Terraform or even get introduced to it? Uh, I have been doing a lot of that personally lately, uh, working with a lot of customers, um, and uh, but that that doesn't scale very well. Right. Uh, so we have uh, examples. We have a uh, we have, we have a thing called Appster Cloud Labs. That's a a service that you can you know run in an Appster environment and, and play with it remotely. Uh, there's that has long had a lab guide, and there's now a complementary Terraform lab guide that that takes the same steps as the as the point and click lab guide. Um, and we've got a repository full of examples uh, of, you know, from various presentations. The recent uh, Cloud Field Day presentation is in there, um, you know. So there, there's a lot of examples, but really, like, there's a lot of just open up YouTube and play with it for a little bit, 
you know, probably against something that's widely used like AWS mm-hmm. uh, would be the place to start. Mm-hmm. Something a little more niche like network config against expensive QFXs is probably not the best way to <laughs> learn Terraform. <laughs> but, you know, once you have a handle on Terraform concepts, uh, applying it to, you know, various services uh, is, is straightforward. You don't need to learn each service. So I'm curious what, you know, when you go out and bring this message to networkers, what's the reaction? Folks that are doing public cloud stuff are super receptive. This is what they wanted. Pure network engineer dinosaurs? Uh, what's Terraform? Why do I want it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, you know, I, part of the reason I'm here is to evangelize Terraform to network people, right? If, if that's you and you and you have not, you know, at least explored this a little bit, you know, check out public cloud and check out Terraform, you know, as a way of controlling it. I'm confident you will enjoy it. Uh, well, thank you, Chris, for being here and, and beginning to spread the message of Terraform to the networking community. Um, where can folks get more information about uh, Appster, about Juniper, about what Juniper is doing with Terraform? The official documentation you can find by Googling uh, Appster Terraform. It's on HashiCorp's Terraform registry. Uh, so it's it's in the right place where uh, Terraform provider docs are expected to be. I don't have to go to Juniper and download it and install it again. Just yeah, yeah, we didn't hide it behind a paywall or uh, you know at an, at an ever moving you know URL that's going to 404 <laughs> or anything like that. It's, it's in it's, the Terraform repository. Just yeah, install it's, it the usual way. Yeah, uh, it, yeah, it's uh, out on the registry operated by HashiCorp. Th- this is where every SRE goes for that kind of documentation. We're right there with the rest of the ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me personally, uh, I'm uh, Chris Margett on you know most of the social medias. Um, especially the hacky derm Mastodon instance. All right. Um, and if you want to reach the folks in Juniper that are working on Terraform, you can uh, email terraform-provider-abstra at juniper.net. All right, that's terraform-provider-abstra at juniper.net. Uh, we'll have all of that information, uh, including the specific URLs we were just talking about uh, to Terraform and to Juniper, uh, with more details in the show notes that accompany this podcast. Uh, thank you, Chris, for taking the time to be with us, and thanks to Juniper for being a sponsor. Most importantly, thank you, the listener, for spending some time with us. Uh, if you like this episode, there are many more fine, free, technical podcasts and our community blog. It's all at packetpushers.net. Uh, if you're interested, we've got a Slack community where you can jump on and talk to other network engineers in the field. Um, you can also follow us on all the socials, especially on LinkedIn. You can hear this podcast on Spotify. And if you would, give us a rating on Apple Podcasts. It really helps. And last but not least, remember that too much networking would never be enough.